Tony Robbins is a best-selling author, entrepreneur, life and business coach who's worked with top athletes, celebrities, presidents and top business leaders. He's impacted millions of people with his live events, programs, books and philanthropic endeavors. Tony is the chairman of a holding company comprising of 50 privately held companies with combined sales exceeding $6 billion per year. He worked with and interviewed 50 of the top minds in the world of finance such as Warren Buffett, Ray Dalio and John Bogle to extract information on how to win in the investing world. So here are Tony Robbins' 6 Rules of Investing. Number 1. You will never earn your way to freedom. You know, I always tell people we're all financial traders. My people say, I'm not a financial trader. Yes, you are. You're trading time for money. Yeah. That's the worst trade you can ever make in your life. Um, somebody who's wealthy has made money their slave. They're no longer the slave to money. And the way they do that is they figured out how to become an owner. And the way you do that in the most simplistic way, I, I even taught it in my first book, was you have to decide there's a percentage of money that you're going to keep forever. You're not going to give it to Kate Spade or Ferrari or anybody else. You can do that too. But there's a percentage of that income that never will be touched, that you will grow and compound and will provide income for the rest of your life so you don't have to work. Now, when I was growing up, everybody's goal was get rich enough so you never have to work. Now, like all my friends are 15, 8, 18 years my senior. People like uh, Steve Wynn in most mm -hmm. of Las Vegas, he's like 74. Uh, Warren Buffett's 85. Uh, Peter Gruber, one of my dearest friends in the world, owns the Golden State Warriors, the LA Dodgers. We're partners in the LAFC football team in LA. Um, brilliant guy, 74 years old. And they're all working harder now than they ever were, and they don't have to work. So the goal is make enough money so you don't have to work, and then you'll do what you love, and you'll pour your time and energy into it. But you have to make that decision. Number two, take advantage of compounded growth. People think that the way you get free, financially free or wealthy, is you get this big score. Somehow I'm going to make a bunch of money, or somehow I'm going to make this investment in Apple and it's going to triple, and that's what's going to make me wealthy. But all the research shows, in reality, people who earn a huge sums of money rarely keep those huge sums of money. And very few people really get to the number that they're really after when they're trying to make that big score. And so I really want to show you a much simpler way. There are, are literally millions of people around the world that have become millionaires and they've done it really slowly and easily because they've just tapped into a very simple power and that power I know you've heard of called compound interest or compounded growth. The idea of growth upon growth, multiplying itself. Let me explain what I mean. I, early in the book I decided one of the people I wanted to go visit with was a man named uh, Burton Malkiel. Bert Malkiel, or Bert, is an amazing professor who's at Princeton, and I wanted to go see him because he wrote a book that's become kind of an investing classic called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, and he wrote it in the 70s, and it's still popular today, and in it, he kind of shook up the investment field because he came up with this idea saying, you know what? People should be able to have a tiny bit of money and own all of the stock market and not pay these huge mutual fund fees that are usually hidden, that are eating away at your ability to grow and compound what you have into real wealth. And he was one of the earliest people to ever come up with this idea of promoting the idea of an index fund. An index fund, again, is really simple. Instead of buying Apple or PepsiCo or Coke or whoever the case may be, you can actually buy this index, which mimics the entire stock market. So you get a micro piece of all these companies, all the best companies, for example, in the S&P 500 or the Standard Poor's 500, if you're familiar with that. And so his idea has turned into a seven trillion dollar year business. And another person I got to spend quite a bit of time with that you learn about here in the book and here with me is a gentleman who started Vanguard, and that's Jack Bogle. He took this idea and he bet his fortune on it. Both of these men understood something. And the, when I sat down with Burton Malkiel, the first thing I said was, look, I know you're a straight shooter. <laughs> the guy definitely shoots from the hip. He doesn't care what people think. I said, tell me, what's the single biggest mistake that individuals make, that investors make in their life? And he said, Tony, beyond a shadow of it's a doubt is they don't take full advantage of the power of compounding. He said, Einstein said it was one of the single greatest inventions of humanity. Understanding it can change everything in your life, and everybody says they understand it, he told me, but very few people tap it. He said, understanding something intellectually is not the same as doing it. If you're doing it, then you know it. If you understand intellectually, you know, like I've said before, that and $3 will almost buy a Starbucks bucket of coffee. So what you really have to understand is how it works. And so I asked him, I said, Bert, what's the best way to teach it? And he went into this riff, and his riff was to tell me the story about William and James. He said, let me just give you a real example. Let's say two guys, William and James, and let's say William starts out at 20 years old, 
and he starts taking a little bit of his money and just locking it down and setting aside and investing it. Let's say he takes $300 a month, $4,000 a year, and he puts that aside and he doesn't touch it and he puts it in the stock market and let's say over time he averages 10%. And let's say he does it in an index fund, so he's not being taxed continuously. So it grows tax-free until the time he's going to take it out. And let's say he makes that investment. Stay with me now. William makes that investment from the time he's 20, puts away that 300 bucks a month, that 4,000 a year, till the time he's 40. He never makes another investment again. That's it. And then we see what he has at age 65. And then on the other hand, he has a brother named James. And James... He doesn't get started when he's 20. He doesn't get started when he's 30. He waits till he's 40, and then he starts to say, God, I better start doing something. So he does the exact same thing his brother did. He starts putting away $300 a month, $4,000 a year roughly. He gets the same exact return, let's say, of 10% in a tax-protected environment. And at 65, from 40 to 65 is 25 years. So he spends 25 years putting money in the system. Think of it, four grand times 25 years is $100,000. His brother, William, he only did this for 20 years, 20 to 40, 20 years, times 4,000, 80,000. So the second brother, William and James, James put in significantly more money into the system, done it longer, but at age 65, they both got the same rate of return. Who do you think is doing better off? I know you know the answer, but the real question is, how much better off? And that's what most people have no clue of. William, who started earlier and quit earlier, has 600% more money. Not 20%, not 50%, not 600% more money. At age 65, both these men who got the same rates of return, but one started earlier and quit earlier, he has $2.5 million for William. And James, who started later and put more money into the system, but he started later, so he got less compounding, he ended up with $400,000 a $2.1 million difference. Now that could be a difference between total financial freedom for somebody or doing okay for a while and at 70 having to get a job to be a, you know, somebody greeting people at Walmart. See, this understanding of compounding is how you can free yourself from this idea that somehow you've got to make this giant score because the more you try to create that giant score, even if you get it, usually isn't kept. Now, how can I say that? Because I've been in this business working with people, some of the greatest entertainers, actors, musicians, sports stars, government officials who go off and make money afterwards. And I can tell you one thing, rarely do they keep it because they've never understood how to really tap into this power. Number three, market crashes are a blessing in disguise. So what you got to know is corrections happen every year. You got another couple of months, you got to know it's 14% yeah. and you won't lose because 80% of the time it doesn't go to a bear. Now, what about the bear? The bear market, it happens, to give you an idea, in the last 100 years, every three to five years. The average length of a bear is one year. The average drop is 33%. Wow. A third of those drops go 40% or above. That, I don't care how well prepared you are, that's a scary thing. Yeah. But it is the greatest opportunity in your lifetime to go from wherever you are financially to where you want to be. I hope your audience is listening right now. Hear me. Mm. If you want to leapfrog and you're a millennial and you think there's no future or you're you know, a baby boomer and you think you're too old and it's too late, the greatest gift you have is coming. I know it doesn't sound like it. This is not positive thinking bullshit. This is the truth. Mm. Wall Street, the stock market is the only place that when things go on sale, people freak out. If I said, you like Ferraris? Sure. If I said to you, Ferraris go on sale for 50% off. Awesome. <laughs> but when I tell so, you Apple's on sale for 50% off, you go, oh, what right. am I going to do here? What's wrong? The whole world's coming to an end. If you think about it, how old are you? 33. 33. So let's assume if you were 35 and you lived to 85, you got mm -hmm. 50, 52 years ahead of you. That means you have 52 more corrections to live through. Right. <laughs> that means you're probably in those 50 years going to have 10 more bear markets to live mm. through. If you're going to have a gut checks every time or you're going to leave out of it. Right. If you didn't participate because you thought, oh, the market's too volatile, I can't trust it, all that stuff, you missed 250% return in the last eight years. Mm. I mean, you, you've missed out on everything while you're waiting for things to be better. And if you won't do it when it's like this, when it crashes, you're not going to get in. Sure. So here's the good news about the bear. The good news about the bear, average ones a year. Could be longer, but that's the average. Mm. Could be shorter. But here's what's cool. Every single bear market in the history of the United States has led to a bull market. Meaning, right afterwards. So 2008, 
this plummeting, what mm. happened in 2009? Up 67% yeah. wow. in a year. I can show you every single bear market, and the next year when it comes out, it's this explosion. Now, that's not true in every market in the world. It's true for two centuries in the United States. Wow. So that's why Warren Buffett says, I want to be greedy when people are afraid. Mm. And I want to be afraid when people are greedy. If you remember 2008, he was telling everybody, buy. He was having the time of his life. <laughs> buy, 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 everything's on sale. So mm. what you have to do to become unshakable mm. is turn, when I always, the metaphor I use is the, turn the snake into the rope. Meaning, we all know the story. It's the middle of the night. You're walking through the yard or someplace and you see a snake mm. and you're freaked out. You pull back. You come in the morning and it's a rope. Once you know it's a rope, you're never afraid again. Yeah. I want to take for people investing and show them how to turn that snake into the rope it really is. And I'll tell you one mm. final stat on all this. People always say, and you started to bring it up, timing. Mm. How do I time it? Like right now, things are too expensive. I want to wait. People have been saying that for eight years. Mm. Is there going to be a correction? Yes. Yeah. But when it corrects, you just you want to invest again. You'll get dollar cost averaging. If you paid a little too much here, you'll pay paying less here. It'll bring the average price to a reasonable place. It's going to allow you to succeed. Number four, diversify your investments. Well, I sat down with the famous Ray Dalio, right? Right. And I, I, I prepared for 18 hours for that interview because he's a genius and there's not that much on him. And I wanted to absorb it all. So I got every little bit of it, sat down with him. And it turned out Ray was a fan of my work, which I was touched by 20 years ago. I guess he listened to my program. So he was very generous with his time. And we spent these three hours, and in the three hours, when I got to the end, I said to Ray, I said, listen, I really want to help the average person, so I got a question for you. I did this with everyone. I said, if you couldn't give your money to your children, any of it, and all you could do would be give them a portfolio or a set of investment strategies or instructions, and they were going to start over and build it, what would it be? And he said, Tony, I spent a decade figuring that out. All my money's already there. My kid's money is there. My money from philanthropy when I'm gone is there because I'm not going to be here and I want something that'll do well in the future. And I don't know what the future is going to be. Markets are going to always change. I need something that could work in any market. I call it my all weather fund. Most of us in the business are familiar with it, it a little bit. And so he explained it to me and I have a good understanding. And I said, I get it. So what you're saying is the reason why, this was obsessed him. Why is it if I have a balanced portfolio in 2008, I got nailed on both sides? Exactly. You know, why did that happen in 2000? Everybody says portfolio theory, this is supposed to protect me, and it didn't work. But he said, as soon as things get better, no one talks about it, we just forget about it. It happens again. It happened in 2000, it happened in 2008. He said, I figured it out. When you have a 50-50 portfolio, right. that's 50-50 of where you put your money in assets. 60, 40, 50, 50, however you look at balanced portfolio, right? But he said, the problem is that's not balanced risk. This is where people are crazy. I've seen people write things up. They see this in the book and say, Tony Robbins is promoting. First of all, I'm not promoting anything. Every word in this book is from the best investors on earth. Anything that's from me is about the emotions. That I know for 36 years. That's been my expertise. These are their views. But I'll tell you what's amazing. He said, Tony, when you have stocks and bonds half and half, you're not equal because equities are three times more volatile. So your risk is 95.5. Number five, fees matter. How old are you? 31. 31, okay. So let's assume you and a couple buddies at 35 managed to put aside 100 grand, and you manage not to add any more money, but to grow it at 7% in spite of ups and downs in the market. And you're 65, how much money do you have? Well, if you paid 1% in fees over those 30 years, your 100 grand became 574,000 bucks. Not bad for never adding another dime. Right. If you had 3% in fees, had the same growth, but 3% in fees, you now have three hundred oh, and twenty-four thousand, almost, almost half as much, quarter million dollars, seventy-seven oh, percent less money, and, wow. and you had the same return. It was just the fees. So the world, most people, you ask them, "What are your fees?" They have no clue. Right. So I've created a site where people can go. They can type it in. You find exactly what your fees are right. and what you should be paying. And it just—it's highway robbery. Where in the world would you pay two thousand dollars, two thousand percent more for the same exact product? You can only do it mm. because the financial industry makes things so opaque, so convoluted and people feel overwhelmed. Number six, improve your psychology. And it's 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. Meaning, so many small businesses, you know, um, the, the owner might be an incredible innovator. Maybe they write incredible code. Maybe they're a tremendous influencer, but they don't know the economic side of their business, right? And they find themselves getting in trouble because somebody's giving them financial information after the fact. They don't have true financial intelligence to make decisions and they get caught up. Someone might be really great in finance, but they're not any good in marketing. So sometimes it's a skill problem, but 80% of it, 
you can solve those skills. You can get those skills if you can change your psychology. But when you accept that, oh my God, the market's down, or oh my God, the economy in our area is down, when you allow the environment to control your psychology, you're not gonna win. There's an interesting guy um, named um, Mel Fisher that you may remember from back in the 90s. He was, if, you, if the name lingers in your mind, he was a guy that spent, I think it was 27 years, if I remember correctly, looking for this Spanish galleon that was supposed to be filled with gold. Do you yes, remember that? Yes, of course. And he found it after 27 years. Now, here's my question for you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> five years into it, you've worked every day for five years, and you found nothing. What are you going to do? <laughs> and how are you going to raise more money? Because you have run out of money. 10 years into it, 15 years into it, 20 years into it. So I say to people in business, I say to them, you want to understand psychology? Here's the biggest challenge for most businesses. They think they've maxed what's possible because they think they've tried everything. Once you believe that, your belief controls you and you miss the innovations, you miss the answers. This guy found that gold because he had three beliefs. First belief was there's a treasure out there and he was certain it was out there even though he didn't have any absolute evidence and that certainty drove him. But if you knew there was treasure in your business, that's not enough. You gotta also believe I will find it. And they also have to believe it's worth it, mm -hmm. right? And without those three beliefs, he never would have found it. And so changing the psychology of the leader is what will change a business faster than anything else. Changing their skills will also do it. But lots of people have the skill and they don't execute. And you and I both know, you know, execution's more important than knowledge. Knowledge is trumped by execution every single day. And that execution comes by changing the psychology. All right, guys, make sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and in the comments below, let me know who you want me to cover next in our six rules of money series. And you might inspire the next video. And as always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.